Our next talk will be from Dr. Sofia Ortega from the University of Missouri. Um, and she will be talking about improving competence of in vitro derived embryos by supplementation of cytokines into cultural mediums. So um, Sophia, thank you. And the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning. Well, I'm gonna take it in another type of road trip. We're not gonna talk about uh, hormones in the cattle in general, but we're gonna talk about the embryos today. And first of all, this is kind of what I focus on studying, early embryonic development, which is all the process. I hope, can you see my cursor? Yes. All the process since the, that oocyte is ovulated into the oviduct, fertilized, and then it develops all the way to the blastocyst stage, traveling from the oviduct into the uterus in the cow. But to make it more complicated, I like to do that in vitro. So I try to mimic, and like a lot of people, this on plastic in an incubator. And what we try to do is mimic a very, very dynamic system that is not nurtured, but many molecules coming from uh, circulation in a Petri dish with everything put since the beginning and with control conditions, if we can call it like that. So when we talk about in vitro embryo production, let's go through the main steps. We collect cumulocyte complexes or immature oocytes, and we put them 24 hours in a control uh, defined maturation medium. After 24 hours, we take those cumulocyte complexes with expanded cumulocells. That's kind of a signal for us that those oocytes have matured. And we co incubate with a sperm. So the small white dots that you will see here are actually a sperm. And we co-incubate to allow fertilization, and that can go from eight hours in a short uh, fertilization system to 21 hours in a long fertilization system. And then we place them in a different cultural medium in the incubator for seven days to produce blastocysts that will either go into a cow or we freeze them to be transferred next. And is this industry actually important? And these are the statistics worldwide from the International Embryo Technology Society from 2020. And just to give you an idea, in vitro produced embryos in bovine is around a million embryos per year industry. So it's not a uh, minor, I would like to say with uh, North America and South America and some part of Europe being the top producers of embryos. But when we think about uh, the embryos itself, we need to compare what happens and how we produce them. So IVD are going to be embryos that are produced in the cow. So females are going to be super ovulated, inseminated, and then those embryos will be flushed. And leaders again will be North America, South America, and Europe. And what is really interesting, when we super ovulate a cow and we produce the embryo in vivo, we have around 50 to 68% embryos that are transferable, meaning that when we flush it, those embryos are viable or have the quality enough to be transferred and hopefully establish a pregnancy. But now, if we move to the in vitro produce, those the, the ones that we culture in the lab, again, we produce above a half a million embryos, transferable embryos a year, but this is the trick. Look how many oocytes we actually collected. And the amount of transferable embryos that we produce in vitro goes from 24% to 33% in, uh, depending on the region. And this will uh, change a little bit depending on the, on the culture system. So we're talking about around a 30% difference in the amount of embryos that are viable to be transferred into recipients based on being produced in vitro and in vivo. And just to be uh, clear here, we're using uh, the statistics I'm using here are from embryos that are collected via uh, ovum pickup, so transvaginally in the cow. I didn't want to use the avatar derived all sites in these statistics because those are even lower. And we don't know, right? When an animal is called and we get the ovaries, there can be many things wrong with them. So these are animals that were healthy, that we collected the all sites and we produce very few transferable embryos. So I hope that this is the stage that this is an important field to fix and something that we need to start working on in order to get 
more embryos produced in vitro and improve these techniques and the attainability of these techniques for the, from the producers. So when we think about competence, I have an issue with these words, competence, quality, better, we don't know what it is. And kind of the accepted uh, concept of competence when we think about an oocyte and an embryo is an oocyte that is able to mature and resume meiosis that can be fertilized and cleave and continues to develop to a form of blastocyst and a competent uh, blastocyst on embryos, that one that can establish pregnancy and eventually produce offspring. So how do we do that? How do we produce those embryos? And this is kind of a classical maturation medium that we use here, let me move this here, sorry, uh, that we use. And I think I will say that it's very, very standard across the industry. And we have these at the main components, right? We use a, a tissue culture media base of salts, and then it's supplemented with either bovine steer serum of F or SBS around 10%. And this will be the protein uh, source of that culture medium. And this is a problem here. This is undefined. We don't know what is an FBS. Batch to batch will change. So, but we have not been able to get away from it. If we start using just specific proteins, we have not been able to mature enough also the same way. We have some sources of antibiotics, uh, energies, and some hormones to promote maturation. And there has been plenty of studies using individual cytokines. I will not go into all of them. And I'm highlighting the ones I'm gonna be talking today, which is FGF2, LEAF, and IGF. And after the oocyte is mature, and then we move to a culture medium, again, there are different culture systems. I'm gonna use one that is widely used, this SOF B2, which is synthetic ovidoc fluid, bovine embryo version two. That's what this means. And again, we do have a source of protein. We went away from the FBS because we start having a lot of issues in the industry with large offspring syndrome and large calves. So we went away from the pure FBS and we started using albumin. And then again, we have some sources of energy, some essential growth factors, amino acids, and antibiotics. Again, within each one of these culture systems, many cytokines has been tested. CSF is one that is one of my previous advisor favorites. Uh, but again, FGF2, LEAF, and IGF has been used, have been used in, in, in media. So, I didn't move the... I'm not gonna go through each one of the pathways because first of all, I'm not an endocrinologist, I'm actually an embryologist, but I'm gonna talk to you about the ones that we actually uh, have been studying this last couple of years. So when we talk about the FGFs of that FGF family, FGF2, we know that it's produced by the thick and granulosa cells. We know that you're gonna find in the luminal and glandular epithelium and you're gonna find that in the conceptus. And there are several studies showing importance for follicle development. LH, granulosa proliferation, also maturation and interferon production. So we think, okay, this is a good candidate. It's involved in all these oocyte processes and it will be involved hopefully in the viability of the conceptus. And the, the next question was, what do we know about it? Has been used in, uh, in cultured medium. So when it's supplemented to OMM by itself, we have some promotion of polar body extraction. So uh, resume of meiosis less apoptosis in the cumulus cells and improve of uh, formation of the blastocyst at day seven. And this is just a, an example. This is from San and in 2012. So this has been uh, going on for a while when we increase pretty much the maturation of those oocytes when uh, FGF2 is supplemented to maturation medium. And when it's supplemented to the culture medium, again, improves embryonic uh, development. And when you inactivate the receptors, development gets delayed. So that tells you, okay, it is functioning early on in develop, and it might be an important cytokine to study uh, through the pre-implantation period in vitro. The next one is uh, leukemia inhibitory factor or LEAF. I'm not gonna go through all the targets of LEAF, but the one I really want to talk about is, is important for embryonic stem cells and maintenance of pluripotency. And these are the pathways that the one by which uh, LEAF 
at. And we know that it's present in the orbitac epithelial cells. We know that it's present in the follicle or cytokine cumulus cells. And then when I started thinking about this, I was like, what is happening in the embryo? Think about the embryo. That embryo needs to maintain a mass of pluripotent cells that are going to give rise to all the tissues in that fetus eventually. So maybe maintenance of that pluripotency is quite critical in vitro, and we might need to potentiate that. So this was another cytokine that really caught my attention when I was thinking about this. We know that when uh, supplemented uh, to maturation medium, has enhanced nuclear maturation, improved uh, cleavage and development of the, to the blastocyst stage. This is some data from 2014. And interestingly, this increased the cell number in the percent of blastocysts. Now this has, I think, kind of increased. I see that most of the blastocysts are around 90 to 100 cells. And I think is that just a result of how the culture system has improved with time and how better are we selecting embryos uh, through time and through culture. And then the last cytokine I want to talk to you about is IGF-1. Again, I'm not gonna go through all the metabolic functions of IGF-1, but we know that you can find it in the cumulus oocyte complexes, in all sites and through the pre-implantation period. And it's also synthesized in the ovary. So when I think about all this, if we need to put an oocyte to mature, we need to provide them all those other things that we'll receive uh, in vitro otherwise. When supplemented in maturation medium, there is uh, some studies showing that it's an increase in mitochondrial potential, which mitochondria is very important in outside maturation, a uh, decrease in apoptosis, and different uh, doses. There already have been a lot of studies on curved doses on, on each one of these cytokines. And apparently, uh, you reduce apoptosis once you start uh, past 20 nanograms per meal. And in cultural medium, this is a lot of work that uh, Dr. Pete Hansen did in Florida, helps with the resistance to heat shock and oxidative stress, and it helps increase development to the blastocyst stage, either at day seven or day eight, when it's, whenever it's measured, uh, concentrations above 10 nanograms per ml. So we have now a decent set of cytokines. And what happened later in the cultural war, in the embryo war, is we start mixing them. And Cytokine combinations start to become very popular. There are some that combine different IGF or TGF, CSF, and, and so on, because they were helping uh, survive stress mostly and increase embryonic development. At this moment, I kind of believe that whatever protein you put will increase embryonic development somehow. Um, then IGF and LEAF combined has been reported, and then EGF, FGF, and, and IGF they also have to uh, seem to improve uh, the amount of trophectoderm cells, so cells that are going to become the placenta, and the hatching rate. So how many embryos actually go out of the zona pellucida and um, elongate. And being at Missouri, at that time, there was a paper uh, coming from Randy Prader's lab and Mike Robert at PNAS, and they used this cytokine combination, FGF2, LEAF, and IGF that we, very uh, low fondly called FLY. And they use FLY in peak in vitro culture, also in maturation, both in maturation and in true culture, particularly for the somatic cell nuclear transfers, because as my you aware, um, Missouri produces a lot of uh, gene editing embryos and they do this by cloning. So by supplementing FLY through the media in peaks, they quadruple deficiency of the survive, uh, survival of those embryos from somatic cell nuclear transfer. I was a postdoc at that time and Randy Prader approached me and said, do you wanna try in bovine? Maybe we do have, we know how these individual cytokines work. We might have some things that might be worth looking in the bovine. And my point with this is, the, the, the problem with this type of studies are difficult to get funded because it's always like, ah, you're gonna try another cytokine. Ah, you're gonna measure embryo development and then try to publish. We took eight months to publish the paper on the show today because it's, oh, everyone has shown an FGF. But the thing is, we need to understand these studies are necessary. We need to move to more defined media to understand how really the systems are working. And that work needs to be done. It's just 
tedious and it's difficult and it's difficult to get funded for that. So at that moment, I was very fortunate to be approached by Clifton Murphy, who uh, passed away earlier this year. And he has a fund, he's a pioneer in embryo transfer uh, since the 50s has been working on this. And he works, he worked with Randy Prather and came and said, Sophia, I'm gonna give you money to hire a student to start working on this. Will you do it? Oh, yes, 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 I'll do it. No problem. And that's how this brilliant student here, Katie, joined my lab. Good or bad, I don't know. You can ask her eventually because it was only the two of us. And so that's 24 seven me all the time doing everything together. So it was a lot of work, uh, but I really do appreciate she started as a master with me and eventually we were able to get her into a national needs fellowship and now she's a PhD student. Uh, and like I, I was mentioning, you know, this is going to be tough because the cytokines have been deeply studied. So now you have to figure out how you're gonna make this unique. And we know that using other species is really promising. So we have to work without funding, grabbing a little money from here, from there, having our love project. And we went for it and we decided starting using the first in maturation, so I said, let's use fly. And based on what we knew from the literature, right, we were expecting having a decrease in apoptosis, improvement in maturation and embryonic development, hopefully increase our number and, um, and have some protection to stress, right? So reduce apoptosis in the, in the blastocyst. So we went ahead and did this relatively simple experimental design. Uh, I do want to mention at this moment, we did not have a slaughterhouse close by. So we have to buy every oocyte, which is very expensive. And it's difficult because if you want to test it in maturation, you have to convince the person who sells the oocytes to add the cytokines and send them back. So we couldn't play too much with the composition of the maturation medium other than just adding the cytokines. And it was quite expensive and I was, why bold to do this? Because each shows I cost like a, a dollar 70 and we did up over a thousand of them. And I did play a lot of uh, my goodwill with by the person who sell the all size and she was very nice to do so. So she either supplemented with fly and send us in the incubator and maturing overnight or without fly. There was the control. We used a bull that we knew that performed consistently in vitro. So we did, we took out the bull effect as much as we could. And we measured things at the end of maturation or we measured development and then uh, did some re-expansion, some lipids and apoptosis in the embryo. So the first thing I wanted to measure was transonal projections in maturation. So this came, this idea came we look at some papers and Collado in Brazil start showing there were some lipid binding proteins that were traveling through those transonal projections and they might be contributors to the lipid accumulation in vitro derived embryos. So one issue that we always have with in vitro derived embryos is that they accumulate too many lipids and we have kind of used that as a, one of the reasons why they don't perform as well and they don't freeze as well. So, I went ahead and said, well, you know, it might be worth doing it. So here they go, Katie, and start staining for these filaments and I start doing confocal microscopy at the middle of the all side to, to be able to do sections. And then yes, she counted individual each one of these filaments in many embryos and those many thousands of filaments and many hours. And one thing that we notice is we try to check uh, that dissociation of those uh, transonal projections through maturation. So at six hours, we didn't have any difference between the fly supplemented and, and control embryos, but beginning the 12 hour, we start seeing that the embryo that are also supplemented with fly start disassociating the transonal projections a little bit faster. And by the time of 24 hours at the end of maturation, it was visible the transonal projections where there were fewer transonal projections in the fly-treated embryos com uh, compared to the control. So the next uh, logical question is probably they do have less lipid accumulation then, if this is happening and kind of going in line to what has been done in, uh, before or, or checking the literature. And I do not know why this looks like that, but um, we checked two things. 
First of all, was do we increase the maturation rate in flight treated uh, cumulus oocyte complexes, had more uh, oocytes progressing to M2 stage, and then we check the content of lipid in the blastocyst. So we mature with fly, we fertilize, let it go all the way to the blastocyst and measure lipids. And here are a couple of examples of a higher accumulation of lipids in the, in the top uh, picture and how the fly ones have uh, less lipids. So kind of prove that idea through, maybe those transonal projections are passing uh, some lipids into the oocyte. And if they take longer into the disassociate, it can result in a higher lipid accumulation um, in the oocytes. And maybe that is part of why uh, they should develop better, right? Yeah, surprise, they didn't. So that was a little sad. We didn't have any difference in cleavage in the amount of oocyte that got fertilized, but then the amount of blastocysts that were produced either based on the number of oocytes and based on the oocyte that actually cleaved, the site got the cleave, did not really change with supplemented fly into maturation medium. And this is not in a small sample. These are 1,400 oocytes, so it's, it's not, and it was done through several weeks, several rounds. So we tried to control that. Um, yeah, so that, that was sad, but we said, okay, we keep going, we keep going. And I tell Katie, come on, let's check re-expansion. Maybe these embryos are just more viable. So when I, when I talk about re-expansion, what we do is we do a slow freezing, which is kind of a cold standard in the industry. And then we throw the straw and we put it in culture medium and check how many of those uh, embryos re-expand. So re-expand and form blastocysts and hatch out of the sauna pellucida. And yeah, we followed them for three days and we did not have any effect. And you could tell uh, what uh, it was very sad, but we keep going. I said, okay, let's measure apoptosis. Maybe let's try to understand and, and let's try to answer the entire question. We did not find any difference in apoptosis. So, okay, this is what I know. So if you put fly into maturation, I reduce the lipids in the embryo, but I did not have any improvement in the re-expansion. So maybe these hypotheses are that lipid accumulation is the one uh, hindering the ability of the embryos to be frozen is not necessarily true in all cases. So this is what we learned when we supplemented fly into maturation. We did improve maturation rate. We did accelerate the disassociation of transonal projections and did crush my graduate student dreams a little bit. Did not increase embryo cleavage or develop it. Did not increase the cryotolerance of the uh, of the embryo, and we did not reduce apoptosis. So what the explanation that we have for that? So possibly is the serum present, right? We remember that that maturation media has serum and that's completely undefined. So we might have some molecules interfering with each other. Like I mentioned before, we have to buy the oocyte, so there were some logistic issues to that. And now we have an avatar close by, so we're kind of uh, trying to finish that question. So that's a work in progress. But this is what we know, at least in maturation. Since we're very strong, we said we're going to study now in culture. And what we decided is, okay, we're going to use again fly at concentrations, same concentration, because they have been kind of widely used and are within physiological range. And we expect improvement in the development to the blastocyst stage, improvement in cryotolerance, and hopefully, um, IGF would also contribute to that development. The first question I had as a Katie, do we have the receptors? Are the receptors even there? Does it work to supplement the cytokines? And so she went ahead and checked them and all the receptors are there. It was really interesting and kind of expected the leaf receptor is kind of higher early on. Remember that at this moment at the four to six cell stage, nine to six cell stage and three dimensional modula, that embryo is all pretty potent. So, we need leaf to maintain that pluripotent system as we go to the blastocyst stage, FGF2, which is just start having more development of the placenta. And we know the FGF2 has a lot of roles in the placenta start to going up a little bit more. Same thing with IGF1. So, okay, that makes sense. The receptors are there. When do we put them? When do we supplement the fly? So let's say, let's start at the beginning, the beginning of culture. Uh, you have the receptors already there. Let's see what happened because 
in my in, in our in our head at that moment was if you start a culture with that pluripotent embryo and you maintain the system, that embryo should be more viable. So we did a similar study. So again, we bought uh, all sites that came maturing uh, overnight. We fertilized with the same bull. We reduced fly or not fly at the beginning of culture after fertilization. And then we measured development and several other parameters to try to understand what a quality or what a good embryo is. We had a different issue now. We have different qualities on the cumulus oocyte complexes at the, at the end of maturation. And what do you do, right? I say, well, let's start separating whenever we have good or bad quality, and we're gonna try to analyze those differently. So we'll start marking good oocytes, bad oocytes, and did all the fertilization. So the work is start multiplying. And just for you to know what I call bad quality, you have none on very few cumulus cells surrounding the oocytes, some on even cytoplasms. And when we talk about good quality is even cytoplasm, very well defined, right? And a lot of expanded cumulus cells and the oocytes tend to be very clumpy. So we supplemented and when, and when we checked this, we didn't have any difference in cleavage. So the amount of embryos that got fertilized, either if they were uh, poor quality, all sites, I'm sorry, or uh, good quality did not change. However, okay, finally, light in the, in the, at the end of the tunnel. When we check development, if you have to begin with poor all site, qual uh, uh, all site quality, you do have a very steep improvement when adding fly, the culture medium. And when you start with good quality all sites, you still have an improvement that is significant just the magnitude is a little bit less, right? Because you start a little bit higher. But now that's interesting. So maybe when we think about what is happening in that system, we need these cytokines early on in development to completely maintain it. We don't resupplement. We put it once and let it go. And it seems to be having a decent steep effect. So what does that mean? Maybe, maybe we are shortening this gap a little bit by using fly, hopefully because now we're moving from the 20s to close to 30 something. So a little bit close to, to what happened in South America when you start with uh, poor quality or you move from the 30s if you start with good quality all sites to close to 50. So maybe we're shortening this gap a little bit and at least improving the amount of embryos that we can produce. Again, these were not small samples. These are 1600 uh, embryos. So we did truly evaluate uh, this procedure. So then the next thing that we did is, do we have a change in cell number? No, non-total cells, non the cells of the ICN, the inner cell mass, which will be the pluripotent cell mass. I will have thought the supplementing fly will improve this, didn't change or the ratio. Uh, there is a common knowledge that in vitro produced embryos do have a bias into more uh, trophectoran cells and it's just because the composition of the media favors more of the epithelial cells. But we didn't, de we didn't see any change on that. And these are some representative pictures. So there was a lot of counting involved there, a lot of time, uh, but we didn't see any difference there. So then the next cool result here is when you supplement uh, fly day one of uh, culture, we improve the uh, cryotolerance. So we went ahead with a slow froze all those embryos and then we start toying and, and put it in culture medium and start following how many of them will hatch, expand and hatch. And what we saw is that by 72 hours, we went from 30 something in the controls to 80% expansion and hatching in the flight treated embryos. And these are the embryos that were like, again, were heated at day one of culture. And then we measured apoptosis in those, um, frozen and tall embryos, and these are some representative pictures of them. And we saw that the embryos that were treated with flying culture did have a decreased apoptosis uh, post-towing. And for you guys, uh, to see how it looks, for example, this is a still considered a re-expanded embryo, right? It survived freezing. This already hatched. But what we see in the control, we see all this variation, but we use the fly, we see a lot of this. So they were kind of more uniform, they expand. And okay, this is encouraging, so we're get going. And we keep uh, checking. We check lipid content because we did it uh, before with the maturation. So we wanted to see, is this a lipid deposit into the oocyte or is lipid metabolism? 
and into the embryo. And what is really interesting is when you supplement fly into the cultural medium, we did not have any difference in lipids. So that kind of supports the idea that really the issue or part of the issue with those uh, in vitro produced embryos is the amount of lipids that get deposited in the oocyte. And they start with higher lipids to begin with. But doesn't uh, the fly didn't really uh, measure or, or fix anything in terms of the metabolism throughout um, development. We also measured reactive oxygen species. We did not find any difference. So they didn't lose, seem to be more stressed, at least at the, at the blastosis prior uh, cryopreservation. The reason why we did it before cryopreservation is I wanted to have an idea if there were stress at the end uh, of culture before freezing to, make, to try to understand if this is part of why these embryos were survived or not uh, the cryopreservation, but didn't change much uh, there. So then another thing that we did is, and this was a fun uh, grading experiment. We did this with three different uh, evaluators and did confocal microscopy in all these blastoses and start kind of a slicing it. So we slice the embryo in half and trying to understand the integrity of the membranes and how that, uh, the, to try to assess quality somehow. And we consider like a grade one blastosis, that one that has very sharp staining of the active filaments and cells clearly organized, membranes were kind of intact. At grade two, you start seeing some breakage, a little bit of disorganization. And at grade three, a lot of disorganization and breakage throughout uh, the embryo. And interestingly, we did this in fresh embryos at the end of culture or embryos that we freeze and then uh, thaw. And in both of the cases, whenever we supplemented fly at the beginning of culture, kind of the cell organization and that uh, quality of the filaments, acting filaments in the embryo was higher. The proportion of the embryos grade one was higher in fly supplemented uh, embryos. So that, okay, start getting together. We improve um, uh, pluripotency, we protect the embryo, GF1, FGF2 maybe, and maintain the integrity of the embryo and that, uh, not only happens before cryopreservation, but also after cryopreservation. So maybe that's part of the idea why they're, they're surviving so, uh, so much better. So what we know about flying culture is improves efficiency of the in vitro culture system, right? We produce more grade one embryos. It means we produce more embryos that we can transfer. At the end of the day, I always think this is a play of numbers. It's not a, like maybe we're not gonna have 80% blastosis, but if we have more blastosis that we can transfer, we are starting increasing uh, our chances to produce more offspring from these embryos. The magnitude effect will depend on the oocyte quality that we start with. And the effects of fly are really not reflected in cell number, inner cell mass or trophectoderm cells, but we do have an increase in the re-expansion and that survival to cryotolerance. What is the next logical question, right? Okay, so we produce more embryos. Do we actually produce more pregnancy? So this is a work in progress, but I did wanted to show a little bit of what we're doing. And this is Katie here. Uh, this is actually her first embryo transfer. So it's been a fun ride. So she's learning all these techniques. And the very first question I had is, okay, we freeze these embryos and we taught them. And when we put it in the culture dish, they re-expand, beautiful. Do they actually, does that actually happen if we transfer to? to a cow. So we did this in collaboration uh, with Alvaro Garcia Guerra at Ohio State University. So it was very kind to synchronize recipient in multiple locations. And we uh, transferred these uh, frozen and tow embryos at day seven. And we flushed those uterus at day 15. We transferred around 65 uh, embryos per each. The recovery was not really that different. This is not an easy procedure to do. So in the 30s, and we measured the conceptuses I made my initials, why not? This is a longer one, and this is one of the shorter one. And I think hopefully you can see this actually, the embryonic disc is right there. And when we measure, I want to remind you, day 15, the embryo already start elongating, but it has not gone through the massive elongation. If we go back day 17, they're going to be very, very long, uh, much longer. So one thing that we notice is the fly were a little bit longer. Uh, we do not have the power yet to do really a more, much statistics. So I, I didn't mention here, it was not significant different, but seem to start a in a little bit better shape. Um, I asked Katie, you know, 
why don't you go and measure a little bit a couple of genes to have an idea if there is something different in these conceptos. We have some preliminary data indicating that these flight treated conceptos had increased expression of uh, interferon tau. So we decided and we're doing right now some RNA-seq, which we'll hope to have results soon to try to understand, okay, we have a different embryo. Is this, we transfer, we have a concept, is this concept is actually different? And then, okay, but do they actually establish pregnancies? So we've been doing this a little bit to, to the few animals that we have back in Missouri. This is my postdoc, Jessica Drum, who has been leading this part of the, the work. And when we transfer fresh embryos out of the culture without freezing, again, I didn't put the statistics because we don't have the numbers yet, but we're working on it. Uh, it's promising. We have 60 40 versus 45% establishment of pregnancy when we supplemented fly in culture and we transfer fresh embryos. And then we partner uh, with Oklahoma State University with Juan Moraes, which was a previous student at uh, Missouri. So when he got his position, I said, okay, you have cows, you can help me. So he's been trying to get me little bits of cows. So far we have transferred 43 of, um, cows with transfer of one embryo, this direct transfer, and 38 animals with controls. Pregnancies still seems to point that is going to be higher in the flight, but we still don't have the uh, power yet, but we're working on it. So it's promising. So it seems like we really do improve these uh, conceptos, but there are many questions. So this is where we are right now. So this is a very work in progress. We're doing RNA-seq not only in the conceptos, but we're also doing it through the implantation development since thank, the tech, thank you to that technology, now it's a lot cheaper to do this. So we're working at the four cell stage around the genome activation modular blastocysts and conceptos to try to understand how all these pathways, what is happening with these embryos when they're supplemented with fly. We're working with some siRNAs to try to investigate the mechanism how the cytokines is working. Now, that we can collect our own oocytes. I have another undergraduate working and I know she's starting to hate me already because she's gonna have to supplement a fly in culture and maturation media without serum or reduced serum. And probably the next question is what happens if you do it continuously? Because they seem to have different effects depending on where is it in the stages. And of course, we need to increase the numbers of transfers to evaluate pregnancy. We are evaluating right now interferon-stimulated genes in PACs. So what do we know so far? What, what, what do we learn as we go? We still don't under, completely understand what are the effects of fly in culture. We know that there things are happening, but we're trying to dissect that. Hopefully the, the idea of using all the cytokines is to move to a more defined culture system and get away from those uh, bovine serum albumins and, and FBS. Marginal improvements. So we didn't fix everything, right? But we start improving, developing, improving performance. And at the end is a play of numbers. So this is an example of some OPU done in, at my lab and you have all the range of all side quality. So you have some that are with very few cumulus cells. It may be, when you are doing this in a business and you have all sorts of donors and these are your donors or think about lactating the cows, right? Those all sides suffer a little bit or the yield is, is difficult and you need to produce embryos. These might represent a good way using fly to improve the maturation of those all sites and hopefully development. So at the end of the day, the way I think it's about this, if I put two culture plates, one I supplemented with fly and the other one I didn't. And in one I produce a hundred embryos that I can transfer and the other one I only produce 80. I already have more embryos that I can transfer. If one has a 5%, 10% more pregnancy, I already have more embryos that are gonna establish pregnancy and more caps on the ground. So at the end of the day, it's always a play of numbers. And when, this is, and when is it going to be feasible? Of course, I recognize that depending on the culture system of the management, this might vary and the results may vary. So I use kind of, kind of the more uh, common culture medium. And the next question is, <laughs> are we doing some epigenetic changes in these embryos? Are we uh, actually modifying some other things that might affect development? So we're working trying to understand that a little bit. So I still a lot of uh, ground to plow, but promising. We seem to be improving our embryos and I'm gonna cut it there. Like I said, this is a work in progress. I have to thank Randy Prader because he partnered up with me in this work and Cliff Murphy, because he really kind of 
get us started and some other collaborators at the uh, University of Missouri, my lab, which is all right here, in particular Katie, which is the one who's been doing all these experiments. Uh, Alvaro Garcia Guerra, Ohio State University, and Joao Morales, uh, Oklahoma State University. I make sure that now I learned that, but the Ohio State University and Oklahoma State University. And so excited for donating the semen and our all site providers. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Questions? You one would come from Adam. <laughs> Adam Beard from Wisconsin. Uh, so do you expect differences between IVP embryos from say a tertiary follicle or a non-atritic small antral follicle versus say a 